when we say we're not our ancestors, we're right. Because when they told the colonizers that enough was enough, they meant it. The Morant Bay Rebellion of 1865, when the black majority rose up against the planter class and the elites of Jamaica, sparked such a brutal suppression that historians believe that it influenced the future of policing in the former colonies. Now, what could have possibly caused a mob of black protesters to surround the Morant Bay courthouse filled with white planters and magistrates, light the courthouse ablaze, and hack to death anyone who tried to escape? In the colonizer's version of this story, the mob was trying to rescue a black man who had been charged with trespassing on an abandoned plantation. But this incident was merely a tipping point for what was a harsh economic time in the post-emancipation era in which the freed slaves were starving to death in every city and town on the island. To compound the issue, the white minority, which were outnumbered 32 to 1, were the only ones who were allowed to vote with the exception of a few mulatto or mixed race people. If blacks wanted to participate in the voting process, they had to pay a large voting fee and most of them couldn't afford it. So of course the House of Assembly was almost exclusively white and they passed trespassing laws that made it illegal for the freed slaves to work on the plantations to feed themselves and their families. Two people were integral to the events of the Morant Bay Rebellion. The first is Paul Bogle, a Baptist preacher who used the power of the pulpit to advocate for the rights of the freed slaves. The second was George William Gordon, the wealthy son of a white planter and a slave woman who himself was a slave until the age of 10. Gordon was elected to the House of Assembly earlier that year and he used his position to become a strong advocate for the impoverished blacks across the island much to the chagrin of his white colleagues. Gordon sought to bring to the assembly's attention that the emancipated blacks were living in slave-like conditions. Hospitals were being neglected and people were literally starving to death on the floors of the poorhouses. Even the dead would go unburied for days. Moreover, in a population of about 400,000 blacks, only about 60,000 were employed and whatever meager wages that they had, they were heavily taxed. A drought only made the situation worse, as meager subsistence farming was nearly impossible. For bringing these issues to the assembly, Gordon was branded as a troublemaker, and the governor, Edward Eyre, publicly denounced him as the most consistent and untiring obstructor of the public business group of Baptist ministers got together and penned a letter to the British Crown asking for some relief from taxation and for lands to be leased at low rates so that they could at least farm the land to feed themselves and their families. The Crown's response? The prosperity of the laboring class depends upon their working for wages steadily and continuously at times when their labor is wanted and for so long as it is wanted. So to paraphrase, if you all weren't lazy peasants, you wouldn't be hungry. Governor Eyre loved this response from the Queen so much that he made 50,000 copies and distributed it across the island. All this set the stage for what would happen next. On October 7, 1965, a poor black man was being tried in the Morant Bay Courthouse for trespassing on an abandoned plantation. A group of blacks from the village of Stonygut marched to the Morant Bay Courthouse armed with machetes and other weapons. When the police attempted to arrest one of them, they allegedly attacked the police and freed the man from custody. The magistrates then ordered that 28 people be rounded up. So the police went into Stonygut to arrest these 28 people. But they were met and surrounded by hundreds of black men who handcuffed the police and took the situation under control. Paul Bogle wrote to Governor Eyre explaining that the people were defending themselves against an outrageous assault by the police. But things came to a head on October 11 when about 500 blacks marched into Morant Bay armed with cutlasses, sharpened sticks and even old guns. There they met a hastily put together militia and after a little bickering the order was given to fire on the mob. About seven mob members were killed before the militia had to retreat into the courthouse, which the mob then set ablaze. Inside were the magistrates and local government leaders who were responsible for the mistreatment of blacks over many years. A few of them escaped through the side windows, 
but most tried to run through the mob where they were fed upon and killed. The rebellion eventually spread to a few nearby plantations and less than a hundred whites were killed. But the reaction of Governor Eyre was swift as it was brutal. Hundreds of blacks, most of whom were innocent bystanders, were rounded up and executed by firing squad and hanging. One text quotes a soldier as saying, We slaughtered all before us, man or woman or child. They were strung up in the burnt archway of the Morant Bay Courthouse as a warning to any future troublemakers. In the end, about 439 blacks were executed. Among them was Paul Bogle, who was seen as the leader of the rebellion. In addition, the homes of about 1,000 blacks were burnt. And just because he could, Governor Eyre ordered the hanging of George William Gordon, a member of the House of Assembly, because he felt that Gordon played a role in antagonizing the blacks to rebel. Both the disturbances and the brutal response rocked the British crown and they demanded an inquiry and removed Governor Eyre from the island. But the rebellion had far-reaching implications. The white minority saw it as a conspiracy among blacks to take over control of the island. They thought Governor Eyre's brutal suppression of the rebellion had saved the colony for Britain and preserved them from shore annihilation.